If you would, please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 11 in the New Testament. Acts chapter 11. You'll find there the record of the church at Antioch, a Gentile church. I want to read to you as you read with me, beginning in verse 19. We'll read through the end of the chapter, Acts 11, 19 through 30. Luke writes, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number, a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. I would like for us to take into consideration what I'm calling learning from the church at Antioch. As the early church was taught and admonished to abound in the work of the Lord, Paul wrote that in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. In doing so, they were to glorify God through three avenues that covers the work of the Lord's church. In Mark 16, 15 through 16, there's the Great Commission, Mark's account of it. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Thus the church is to take the gospel to those who have never known it. Because the gospel is God's power to save men, Romans 1 verse 16. Then we learn from James 1 in verse 27 that part of pure and undefiled religion is to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Thus, they were to take care of people who could not take care of themselves. And then we see from Romans 14 and verse 19 that they were to strengthen or edify those who were Christians, those who were already saved from their sins. Paul wrote, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. So we are thankful for the inspired historical accounts of the Lord's church. Some of them challenging the best that is in all of us to understand what it really means to live a faithful Christian life. So the church in Antioch is one great pattern or example of such a congregation. When Stephen was martyred, as we read, a tremendous, a very great persecution against Christians arose, and everybody was scattered everywhere except for the apostles who remained in Jerusalem, Acts 8, verses 1 through 4. And we've already read that, too, in the 11th chapter. I read in the beginning, 11th chapter of Acts. 
Now these are Christians who are persecuted because they believed in Christ. They preached the gospel. They understood it. They tried to convert others. They believed Mark 16, 15 through 16. And yet the very thing that drove them out of Jerusalem and scattered them around is the thing they preached because they knew that's the only way of salvation. They love God, they love the church, and they love those that needed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Antioch's about 300 miles from Jerusalem, and yet as they went, that's one place the Holy Spirit had Luke record where they taught the truth. And thereby the church in Antioch began. So the word was preached. It's the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. It's the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. And that word was understood, it was believed, and it was obeyed. And thus the church was planted in Antioch. Now this is God's formula. It works that way every time. It does not change. And as we take the Great Commission seriously, then we will learn these things and we will teach these things because that's the way people become Christians. And that's the only way they become Christians. And I'd like for us now to look at the strengths that were in this relatively young church, a Gentile church in Antioch of Syria. I think we can safely say from our reading in Acts 11, 22 through 26, that it was a taught church. They had learned what their duty was to God. They didn't say we've got to be in the church 50 years before we can ever begin to teach. Or is there the idea that every teacher had to be as good as every other teacher before they went about trying to do what they could to take the gospel to those around about them. I think it's also interesting that the church in Jerusalem was not jealous of Antioch. You can see that they sought to help that church. They send Barnabas up there. And, of course, he's already described as a great exhorter. In other words, act upon what you know. Put it into practice. Get with it, Acts 4, verse 36. And through his work, we see that the church in Antioch grew, Acts eleven twenty four, which we read a moment ago. For he was a good man, it says of Barnabas, we read again, and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. I will pause here and parenthetically insert they didn't join the church. They heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel. And as it is said in Acts 2, verse 42 and 47, when the church began in Jerusalem, they were added to the Lord. Now, they were novices. They were new at this. It is true they needed to grow in the faith and in greater understanding. And this is exactly what Jesus taught in the Great Commission. as recorded by Matthew in chapter 28. 19 through 20, all power and authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Peter, who preached the sermon that is recorded in Acts 2, and was there the day the church started, had this to say to Christians in 2 Peter 3, 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To, whom, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, I didn't know Jonathan was going to sing that song, His Grace Reaches Me. But the favor of God that we don't deserve and cannot merit never reaches us apart from the preached word. It just doesn't. You won't know about all that God's done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves regarding the forgiveness of our sins and living the Christian life except through the Word of God. Paul, in writing to the Romans, reminded them of that in the last verses, or verse really, of chapter 5 in Romans and verse 21. As he explains how sins in the world and death through sin, he says in verse 21, last verse of the chapter, that as sin hath reigned, that means sin ruled, as sin hath ruled or reigned unto, in order to a given point, what was it? Death, separation from God. Even so, might grace reign or rule. Watch the preposition. Through. Through something. Grace reigns through something. Through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. God's favor 
travels through something. It reigns or rules in your life, my life, every other Christian's life, through righteousness. But you remember, David said in Psalms 119, verse 172, My tongue shall speak thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. So it is the righteousness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No wonder you said the gospel is the power of God to save. That the grace of God travels. So you must preach the gospel to every creature. Because you're preaching the grace of God. You can't preach the grace of God without preaching the gospel. And you can't preach the gospel without preaching the grace of God. And if you read what Barnabas did when he got to Antioch, that's what he continued to do. So where the gospel goes, the grace of God goes. And the conditions of salvation, how to benefit from that which you don't deserve and could not earn and could not merit, comes to so the terms of pardon are plainly set out. And Paul, writing to those who believed and obeyed the gospel in the church at Rome, reminded them of that before he launches into what we have is chapter 6. And that's interesting that it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. In the Greek, it's may it never be so. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, he's saying, if you'll remember back what you really understood and obeyed when you became a Christian, you'll know the grace of God reached through through your, you through the belief and obedience to the gospel and being baptized into Christ. Now live striving to put into practice the principles of righteousness that's found in the New Testament, and you'll continue in the grace of God. And as we read before we got into this part of this, you will be strengthened by the grace of God. So we see also not only were they a taught church and nobody's ever, ever developed and nobody's ever grown spiritually except they were taught. The church is a teaching institution. But because they were taught and they understand the work of the church and individual responsibility of every member of the church, they were a benevolent church. Look at verses 27 through 30. And you'll see that they were busy about taking care of those who could not help themselves, as we quoted from James 1, verse 27. A part of pure and undefiled religion is to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. They demonstrated their love to the needy, believers, back down there, in Jerusalem. They took up a collection and they sent it down there to the elders for it to be distributed among those who need it. The unselfish and benevolent spirit of these believers is quite remarkable and serves as a great example to you and to me. We need to be benevolent and know that it is a part of being faithful to the Lord, James 1.27. The old saying that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, how could you know the truth of Jesus Christ that he went about doing good and the spiritual body of Christ, of which we were members in particular, as they were in the church at Antioch, they didn't do the same thing. They put into practice, according to the teaching of the New Testament, this attitude of helping others as the Bible directs them. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 6 and 7. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I think it's interesting that that word cheerful crumb comes from a Greek word. And you can hear where we get a certain word in our English language when you hear what it is. Hilaros. Hilaros from which we get our English term. That's hilarious. Do you realize what he's saying about the members of the church and their desire to give, their love of giving? They were just overcome with joy to be able to give. What a while they felt that way. Well, what do you remember when you would take the Lord's Supper? Who gave what to save our souls? Can we ever outgive Jesus Christ? Can we ever grow in the knowledge of the Bible concerning living the Christian life that we can ever begin to give what he gave? No. So we need a little hilarity when it comes to that kind of thing. 
And I might remind you that in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, he's talking about giving beyond your prosperity. He's talking about going beyond your normal giving. We see that this was an unprejudiced and a very united church. In verse 1 of chapter 13, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon and Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now notice that five people are mentioned in this verse, and they're prophets or teachers. And they reflect a great diversity of background. Sometimes we forget this when we talk about the Jews, then we talk about the Gentiles. Get her on the Gentile side, the Gentiles of every description and every background. Even when you read of the list of people that were gathered as Jews and proselytes, there on Pentecost, look at the list of countries they come from and with all their own cultures, even so much so that as the apostles preached in tongues, they spake unto them where they heard each man in his own tongue, wherein they were born. So they had their various ethnic backgrounds, but there's no indication in the church at Antioch, and what an example that is to all of us, that there was any prejudice among them. They were one. Now, why were they one? Because they all believed in the same God, they all believed in the same only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by Him. They all believed in the same gospel. They all believed in the same plan of salvation. They all believed in the church and its work, its organization, and worship. They believed all of that because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and they all were the same faith, Romans 10, 17. And thus, they held all things common. So regardless of their ethnic background, the color of their skin, or whatever they were, there was no difference in the gospel that saved them. There was no difference in the doctrine of Christ that kept them bound together. They all believed the same thing about worship. They all believed the same thing about the five avenues of worship. And one of the great joys I've had in traveling over the world is to meet with brethren all over the place. And as they were joined in one mind by the same one doctrine of Christ, we all worship the exact same way. We all preach the same gospel. And that is an amazing thing when you would look around the room sometimes and see various ethnic backgrounds. I remember in the church at Singapore, you would see Malays, you would see Thais, you would see predominantly Chinese, you would see Thais from Thailand. You would see... All these people, and there we were, all believing and doing the same thing when it came to serving God and worshiping Him. So they had all obeyed the gospel. They are all baptized into Christ. And as his Paul talked to the churches of Galatia, what he talks about in beginning verse 24, wherefore the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But when that faith is come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, for we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Then for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, they put on Christ. Now watch it. There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. It doesn't mean that a man, doesn't have, uh, that a man and a woman have the same roles in life. Or that husband and wife have the same roles in life. Or parents have the same role in life or children. What it means is it's the same doctrine that saved you. It's the same doctrine that governs your life. It's the same God you worship. The same Savior that saves you. And it's the same truth that you follow. It does not change. The Bible condemns racial prejudice or bias. James dealt with that because and these are members of the church, mind you, and uh, James is one of those that wrote to Jewish Christians, and they had a problem with this. That's one of the reasons the church of Antioch, being a Gentile church, that it was so important that they sent money to that Jewish church and in Jerusalem. Because you see, that didn't just help them in the great dearth that came upon them. 
it showed a relationship that did not exist under the law of Moses between Jew and Gentile because guess what? Those Jews became Christians just like those Gentiles became Christians. And they all worship the same God through the one Jesus Christ and his gospel. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So the Jews had a hard time in converting to Christ to get out from under all those things they had done for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that involved serving God, that involved all sorts of ceremonies and various things they couldn't eat and could eat and all that. And that's not how you determine who's faithful in the church. So they had a problem with that. And you see that reflected in several letters that Paul wrote trying to show that you don't judge who's right and wrong in the light of the law of Moses anymore or who kept what day, a feast day and who didn't. You judge it all on the basis of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. So the unbiased unity of believers is actually even seen in uh, the Lord's Prayer in John 17, 20 and 21. And that's not the model prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer that he played that they all might be one, even as we are one, speaking of his Father and him. And the oneness is that we all approach God on the same level by the same truth. And there's no different things of different people. So Paul would write to the church in the city of Philippi, Fulfill, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And of course, he rebuked the church at Corinth because they had not been of the same mind and the same judgment. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. So I think you can see that you're ready to note that this is a very busy church. The scripture says in Acts 13 too, they ministered to the Lord. Now, how does a church minister to the Lord? Well, a minister is a servant. You minister to the Lord by doing the work of the Lord. If the Lord's work's done, the members of the church do it. If the Lord's work's done, it's because members of the church don't do it. It's that simple. When it comes to spreading the gospel, the Lord's not going to speak directly from heaven. There's not going to be angels come down. It's going to be his spiritual body and members in particular that learn the truth, love the souls of men that need the gospel, and they go out and they teach it. So they ministered by doing those things pleasing to God. They would be ministering even as we are now in worship governed by the authority of Christ. As I've said in teaching the alien sinner, whatever is necessary to cause Christians to be stronger and assisting the needy. That's the three-pronged effort of the work of the church, teach the gospel of the lost, edify the saints, and help the needy. So they were very busy in God's service. The question I always raise here about myself, well, David Brown, are you a worker of the Lord like they were? Well, I have to be. Why do I have to be? Because that's what it means to be faithful. Well, why is it important to be faithful? Nobody but the faithful are going to heaven. It's that simple. Are you a spiritual person? Well, if you're faithful, you are. You're not spiritual if you're not faithful. But a faithful person is a commandment keeper. Because the whole duty of man is to what? Fear God and keep his commandments. Who's the spiritual person? The person that doesn't fear God and keep his commandments? Or the person that fears God and keeps his commandments? And who is the faithful person? Why is the person that fears God and keeps his commandments? And we're talking about the commandments of the Lord. So Hebrews 5 and verse 9 comes out and says he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And that's another letter written to Christians. Mark Twain once said, I do not like work even when someone else is doing it. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's a description of some members of the church. Uh, there are many things that vie for our attention that put our spiritual pursuits on the back burner. How much time do you have to give to no telling what, but how much time do you have when it really comes to doing the work of the church? And there's where the rubber meets the road. That's just all there is to it. Uh, and I can't answer that for you, but I do know the Bible still says, by their fruits ye shall know them. So it's what I bear in my life. It'll show out where my interest really is. You know, it's, it's terrible when people can be members of the church so long, and it's very hard just to get them to assemble. That, do you think that speaks well of their Bible study? Serious Bible study. Of their contemplation of their own life and the light of it. Of the prayers that they pray. Of the concern they have for their brothers and sisters in Christ. 
I, I have been amazed all my life as a preacher, and that grew out of my Christianity, at how many people pick all sorts and sizes of every other thing, but, and, and the church is just left last. Where they move, what they plan on doing, their jobs, their education. The church is sitting somewhere back over here. We'll take care of that when we get all the other done. There's no way anybody that knows their Bible can think that that's the way the Lord wants it done. So are we too busy to have time for the Lord to do the work that's there? If so, all I can say is we're too busy. You know, you can't even live your family life like you ought to if you don't live like the Bible teaches. And so how are you going to teach kids the importance of first things first, Matthew 6, if you don't start in the home? It's not just to be taught from this pulpit or in the classrooms. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus saying in chapter 2 and verse 10 of that book, For we, that's the church, each one of us, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And we all know, as I started out and quoted part of this verse in the beginning of the lesson, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This church at Antioch, when you read these verses again and think about them from Acts 11, 19 through 30, was a receptive church. What do I mean by that? Well, let's read Acts 13, 2 through 3. Acts 13, 2 through 3. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. You know, if I had been a member of the church of Antioch, I would have hated to see Paul leave. You've been there the whole time Paul had been there? Think of the teaching you had got. But now it's the Lord's will, as the gospel is being spread, that they send him out on the journey that fit into what he was to do. So the Holy Spirit gave the Antioch congregation the command to set apart Barnabas and Saul for specific work. And by the way, it was Barnabas that brought Saul there. So Barnabas got there first from Jerusalem, and look at all the things he had done. And now these two men are leaving? Well, what I see in this church is that they responded obediently to the Lord's will. Notice, they sent them away. That's what the Scripture says. They sent them away. There was no questioning. There was no second-guessing. There was no, let's send somebody else and let's keep them here for us. That's not the way the church grows. How do we respond to the Lord's will? That's really the question. Our disposition of mind, our attitude toward God's word, really reveals our attitude toward God. Now, I want you to think about that. Our attitude toward God's word actually reveals our attitude toward God himself. Notice how it's linked up in a passage I quote many times in John 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me, Jesus said, and receiveth not my word, hath one that judges him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. There Jesus says, you reject my word, you reject me. So as I appreciate his word, I appreciate God. As I don't appreciate his word, I don't appreciate God. So receiving God and his word are connected closely. If we don't have time for the scriptures, what are we really saying? We don't have time for God. Scripture, then, as presented by Paul to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, is God breathed as if it flowed right out of the very depths of the being of God for the good, our good. And we cannot mistreat the scripture without mistreating God. You can't do it. You cannot mistreat, mistreat the scriptures without mistreating God. An evangelistic church is what this church was. In Acts 13, 2 and 3, that's made very clear. They were ready to do what God commanded, which was to send Barnabas and Saul on a preaching tour. And of course, this is the beginning of things in the miraculous age, the apostolic age. They don't have a completed New Testament. 
uh, the gifts are in the church through the laying on the apostles' hands. The apostles have all the gifts. They had to have that to be what they ought to be. But while that was going on, then this church had matured spiritually and sent their friends out to spread the gospel. They knew that God would provide other teachers and prophets to continue to help them. Now think of that. If everybody did that, and that's exactly what happened, or you couldn't have Paul writing in Colossians that the gospel had gone to the whole world. In other words, by the time Paul wrote the letter to Colossians, everybody had had an opportunity to obey the truth. You know how that happened? One on one, one on another, two, three, four, five, and the whole church taking it exceedingly seriously about their job here because it's all transient and temporary. You're just here for a little time, no matter how long you live, and what are you to be doing while you're here? The first preaching tour began and ended in Antioch, chapter 14, 25. The second preaching tour began and ended in Antioch, Acts 15, 40. 41 through chapter 18, verse 22. And the third preaching journey began in Antioch, Acts 18, 23. The question that comes down to me as I consider why this account of Antioch is in the Bible and what I read about it for my own good is am I of the same disposition of mind? Coming toward the end, we want to notice this. There was trouble in the church in Antioch. Trouble in the church of Antioch. Let me say it again. Trouble in the church of Antioch. There will always be where God's people are striving with all their heart and all honesty to live the truth and preach the truth. Trouble. Why are we surprised? We shouldn't be. Have you ever heard of the devil? <laughs> now what is he doing? What does he do all day long every day? He takes note of people that are interested in sacrificing to do the Lord's will. And he seeks to destroy them. I guess too we ought to say this. Where there are people there are problems. And thus the church of Antioch was no exception. In Acts 15, 1 and 2 you see that the false doctrine through false teachers that came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And Paul and Barnabas immediately challenged them. They were the Judaizing teachers. said, you Gentiles must be circumcised to keep the law. You can't be saved. And they immediately got in the middle of them. And all you have to do is read Galatians chapters 1 and 2. And you'll be able to see just how fast Paul got in the middle of that. He said we didn't give space any time. We didn't put up with it. So those who became known as the Judaizing teachers corrupted the plan of salvation. And you have then Paul directed by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem not to learn what the truth was. Let's get that straight. He already knew what the truth was. Jesus, by revelation, of, uh, by revelation through the Holy Spirit, taught him, as he did every other apostle, what the truth was. That's why he could contend in Antioch with those who taught a false doctrine. So why in Acts 15 did they go down to Jerusalem and have that conference? They went down there to identify where this came from. And if you read Acts 15, you'll see immediately it came from Pharisees that were Christians. They were the ones that decided they would teach that Gentiles could be saved by believing in Christ, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Christ, being baptized into Christ, being circumcised, keep the law. That was the Judaizing teacher's plan of salvation. And that first effort of error in the church was not a liberal effort, loosing where God is not bound, but it was an anti Binding effort, binding on men what God did not bind on them. In this case, it was Gentiles had to be circumcised to keep the law. But that false doctrine was opposed. It was refuted. The people teaching it were identified, and they dealt with them. Every person, every family, every church, every nation will face trouble because where there are people, there's trouble. The church is going to face trouble because it's the spiritual body of Christ. And what did the fleshly body of Christ face? Because he lived a perfect life, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. He was crucified. Now why do we think that we are going to be exempt 
from all that. I don't know why we think it. I've been preaching this all these years. I have yet to figure out why people think it. And I'm not going to attempt to try to figure out why they think it because they've got the same Bible I've got and they can read about Antioch just like I can and all the rest of it's there. And they can read all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That can only mean one thing. And you know what it means? All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah, but. I don't care. Yeah, but. People do that about Acts 2.38. It still means that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, what am I to do about that? Get ready for it. Because it doesn't change the gospel. It doesn't change the work of the church. It doesn't change what we ought to be. It just means there are mean people in the world. It means there are false brethren in the world. They're not going to leave next week. They're not going to leave 20 years from now. They're going to be here. But I don't have to be one of them. And I can oppose them just like Paul and Barnabas did in Antioch. So I don't know where we come up with some of these ideas. But uh, we must never deviate from the truth, compromise to keep peace. We must meet the trouble head on in the light of truth. That's exactly what they did in Antioch. They didn't put up with it a moment. They dealt with it. And then they went right to the root of the cause and say, who's teaching this? Where did this come from? And they found out. So I think there's a great lesson when we realize why God, and I hope by this lesson we've done some of that. Maybe we don't see all of it in it, but why God gives us this account in the book of Acts of the church at Antioch and what it was doing. So we can learn from the church at Antioch as we can learn from so many things. Because we are the church today as they became the church then or vice versa. By the same gospel, by the same belief, by the same obedience, uh, every way that a person lives to be a Christian. It's all right here in the New Testament. It will be there to meet us on the day of judgment. So let's bolster ourselves up. Let's have greater faith. A faith built upon a thus saith the Lord proposition. And not let things blow us like trees in a wind. It doesn't make any difference what these people do or don't do or whatever kind of doctrine it is is false. The Bible hasn't changed. It reads today just like it reads when it was finished. It'll read and mean on the day of judgment just like it reads and means now. So if you're not a Christian, you have the same gospel that will make you a Christian today that they had then. And we went and know the gospel a moment ago, believing in Christ based upon the truth of the Bible. Repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. And as a child of God, we know what the New Testament says about living in the church. We know how to deal with things. You've got a problem, it's already been solved here and given to you. It's just up to your interest to find it. The solution's there. Folks, listen. There is no problem that'll come up with you personally, as a family, or as a church that hasn't already been solved and written down for you to take and apply it. Never had. It's right there. It's been here 2,000 years. And the only way it works is for us to gird ourselves up and be willing to make the necessary sacrifices to always comply with the truth of God's Word. That's the way that's right and can't be wrong. And if as a child of God your faith is wavered in some areas, you need to bolster yourself up by returning to what you know the Bible teaches. Repenting of your sins, confessing those sins, and praying God for forgiveness. And let us work as they worked, and let us be as they were, for we have the same book they had. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.